Assalamu alaikum. Okay, now you can go to sleep a little later, but l at least let me know that you're awake at the very beginning. So, if I give you this greeting of Jannah, Assalamu alaikum, you will say, Wa alaikum salam. Very good, alhamdulillah. I want to first thank uh, Light Media and Wolves ISOC for affording me this opportunity to come to this very prestigious university. You know, coming from the state of North Carolina, which is in the mid-Atlantic, but as you can tell, I'm from, it's considered a southern state. So if you don't get anything else from my presentation this afternoon, you can amuse yourself with my southern accent. From the part of the country that I come from, we talk sort of slow. I'll try to speed it up for the British cadence, but we're slow talkers. But I want to just share a few moments in talking with you about this topic of the eye of the tiger. And I'm curious here in the UK, uh, do you have any idea, because this is almost an American cultural reference, uh, what this eye of the tiger uh, in film, what this relates to. Does anyone have an idea about this? Rocky. Rocky, very good. And Rocky was this fictional character created by an American actor by the name of Sylvester Stallone. And Stallone started this character in 1975. And there were so many iterations of the character that the series, the Rocky series, went on to 2006. And a classic song in this series was a song called Eye of the Tiger. And the Eye of a Tiger is a kind of reference not only to an animal, but it was used in this song for the series. And I don't know, I know about cows and sheep and things like this. I don't know about tigers. But I'm told that if you look a tiger in the eye, if the tiger looks you in the eye, it's a very great probability that you're that tiger's next meal. So it's a reference to staring death in the face. So if any of you are ever somewhere and the tiger's there, don't look it in the eye. Just look away and run and do something else. But this reference of staring death in the face is something that Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone, in creating this character, he had these, these boxers, one, by the name of Apollo Creed, who was just a traditional boxer, but he was very good. Then he came up with this guy called Clubber Lane, who was this big, ferocious guy with a mohawk haircut, and surely Rocky would be killed in the ring by fighting this big, brutish-type character. And then, finally, he came up with this character, Ivan Drago, who was this big, huge, Russian guy, and all he had done for most of his life was to be trained to get in the ring with people like Rocky and just knock them out. But the whole idea for this series was f facing death, just squarely in the face, and then somehow overcoming this obstacle that's in front of you. And so I want to use that kind of cult cultural reference in the States to begin this talk about you and I every day staring death in the face. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have made it clear that every single one of us will have a taste of death. Allah makes it clear that no one is going to get out of this world alive. It's a reality that no one can escape. Death is undefeated in its pursuit of every human soul that will walk the face of the earth. I want to read just quickly just a few words from Ali ibn Abu Talib, radiallahu anhu. When he was the emir of the believers, Ali was very much known for the wisdom and uh, how he could so well articulate. But I'll read this English translation of what Ali was said in one day when he mounted the member. And he was saying, <clears throat> as he thanked Allah, he mentioned death. 
And then Ali was quoted as saying, O oh Allah, slaves, there's no escape <clears throat> from death. If you stand in this path, it will take you. And if you run away from it, it will take you. So seek for safety first, for there is a vigorous seeker pursuing you, the grave. Beware of his smallness, darkness, and aloneness. Verily, the grave is either a hole of the fire or a garden in paradise. Verily, the grave speaks three times each day and proclaims, I am the house of darkness. I am the house of worms. I am the house of aloneness. Verily, what comes after that is a day in which the baby gets white hairs and the adolescent becomes drunk. Brothers and sisters, I just want to read one other very brief quote. And this is from one of the Tabi'in, one of the companions of the companions of the Sahaba, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu a brother by the name of Hassan Basri, or Hassan al-Basri. And Hassan al-Basri was one of the famous Tabi'in. Tabi As a matter of fact, they say that on the death, on the Janaza day of Hassan, Hassan al-Basri, that there was no one present in the Jami Mosque to pray Salatul Asr because virtually the entire town had come out to pray this Janaza prayer for Hassan al Basri. And I want to read this brief quote from him that he was asked by one of the Muslims at that time, O oh, Abu Sa'id, what should we do? We sit with people who bring fear to our hearts, so much so that our hearts would almost fly away in fright. Hassan el Basri answered <clears throat> by saying, by Allah, it is better for you to associate with these who bring fear to you so that you may gain safety than to associate with people who make you feel safe for you might earn fear in this case. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, these two instructions from Ali ibn Abu Talib and Hassan al-Basri emphasize the fact that we should remind ourselves of death, that we should associate with those not who are just making us feel good about what we're doing, but either through words or through their behavior and their actions. They serve as a reminder. They are a mirror to, one, to us, that we look upon individuals and we are reminded about death. Not because, I don't know if you have this phenomena in the UK, but we have the phenomena in the United States where college students and high school students and sometimes students even younger go through this, what they call in the States, a gothic phase. That these, do you have this here? Not yeah. But these kids are creepy, in my uh, humble opinion. They're very creepy. Hope none of you have painted your nails black and put all kinds of black around your eyes and only wear black in a creepy kind of way. But these are people that when you look upon them, and if you're not creeped out about, uh, by their appearance, you at least have to start thinking about death. Maybe they're trying to imitate this other personification of death in the States called the Grim Reaper. This is this hooded character with a big sickle that runs after every soul to try to take their lives. But to associate, associate with those who are reminding us of death does not mean that you pick out these gothic kinds of people and you hang around them because their appearance just reminds you of death. It means that we want to be around those who are reminding us through their behavior or through their admonition. I want to remind you and remind myself that the specter of death is something that from the youngest of age, right now, 
you should start adhering to this instruction from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to think about death often. I can remember the time when I entered university and I had a very dear friend by the name of Norman. And Norman was a 16 year old, the rest of us were 18 year olds or older, who had entered university because he was so precocious, a very highly intelligent young man. And he had entered u university at this age, but at 16 he had a beard, a big thick beard. The young man looked like he was 25 or 26. And so because of his appearance, many of us and how mature he was, many of us were attracted to him. In less than a year, Norman became my best friend on campus. But Norman and this, by our second year, Norman had embraced Islam. And Norman used to talk to me about Islam. I was not yet Muslim. And he would talk to me about Islam, but he would always tell me, you know, you're too serious. You're taking things too seriously. Why don't you lighten up a little bit? I should be the one who is as serious as you are because I'm Muslim. So lighten up. Don't always try to be serious about things. Enjoy life. Lighten up. And so as much as I would want to just adhere to what my friend was telling me, it was difficult to do that because that at that time was not my nature to just lighten up and be so lighthearted. There were too many uh, uh, causes and issues that were demanding atten my attention that I could just be so lighthearted about. And then one day I came to school and another friend of mine said, well, I guess you heard about your boy, Norman. And I said, no, what, what, what happened? I was off campus for the weekend, what, what happened? And he said, well, you know, Norman was killed in a car wreck. He was gone home to Philadelphia and he was in the car and he had gotten killed in this wreck. And there were two other Muslims who were upperclassmen in the car as well. And so that death of Norman, that this, this at such a young age, I think he was about 17 years old at this particular time, that it made a very deep impression on my heart. And even to this day, there are very few weeks that go by that I don't make dua for my friend. This has been over 30, almost 40 years ago. But every week, at least once a week, I think about him. And I think about his telling me to lighten up. Don't be so serious. And this was coming from him because he had articulated that we are so young that we have so much time to think about death. And then when we get older and death approaches us as a result of some disease or some other kind of illness, then we will be prepared. But little did Norman recognize and realize at that time that he was one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's khada was not going to allow him to reach an old age where he would die by so-called natural causes or die by some disease that's consistently with a geriatric uh, population. So the time to start thinking about and staring death in the face right now as a young person, that now is the time to start this process because we never know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call us. Let me share just one other story and I'll uh, move on. A few months ago I had a very major back surgery and I was more debilitated, physically debilitated uh, doing this process than I've ever been in my life up to this point. It was a kind of surgery that I start to wonder Will I ever even be able to walk again? That uh, I had so little range of motion and so little ability to even walk for a while after the surgery that I start to question, will I be able to walk? And after I got past this phase of thinking, can I walk again and able to walk without a walker? 
Then something strange started happen, happening to me. It was like in my house, and when I was able to go back to the masjid, with my peripheral vision, even in the bedroom of my house, if I saw a shadow in the corner, if I saw a coat hanging across the door in my peripheral vision, I began to wonder, is this the angel of death coming after me? I would go to the masjid and someone would approach me from behind. And as I looked over my shoulder, I was looking, is this the angel of death? Have somehow have I treated death, uh, trick, uh, uh, gotten over on death on the operating table, but now I can't believe that I can enjoy a full and long life that death is lurking right around the corner. As a matter of fact, he's in my bedroom. He's in the wudu station. He's everywhere. And this went on for quite a long time. So I'm not advising people to start getting paranoid and thinking that the angel of death is right wherever you are. But what I do advise is that this staring death in the face is not like looking into the eye of a tiger. Staring death in the face for the believers is living our lives in a way that we would be close to being satisfied that whenever the angel of death makes his appearance and takes our soul, that we would have, we would have feel, we feel that we've done the best that we could possibly do. That there's nothing else that we possibly could have done, that there is no act of charity, of sadaka, that we left without on the table, as you say, that we didn't do and give in sadaka, and I have money in my pocket. I know I have access to funds, and I see a need in front of me, and yet I ignore that particular need. Brothers and sisters, staring death in the face. I want to uh, just give one uh, reference from the American experience of Islam. And I want to talk just for a second about one of the uh, first contemporary, and I'm saying contemporary within the 20th century and 21st century, one of the first shaheed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose from the ranks of the Muslims, uh, from the ranks of the people who, like myself, was a convert to Islam. And I'm talking about Al-Hajj Malik Al-Shabazz, or more commonly known and referred to as Malcolm X. You know, Malcolm lived just 11 months of his life on the Sirat al-Mustaqim. Before that, he was involved in an organization that regardless of how much I acknowledge and we acknowledge the good social and community work that they did, they were, had ideas, they had an aqidah that contained very strong elements of shirk, saying that their leader was a prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying that the person who founded the organization was actually the physical reincarnation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now this is not the angel of death coming over my shoulders, so I'm okay with that now. Before, I may not have been okay with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And when al Haj Malik Shabazz left the Nation of Islam, the members of the Nation of Islam and its leadership were intent on killing him. And not only was the leadership of the Nation intent on killing him, but many like myself believe that the U.S. government and its various intelligence apparatus, its various law enforcement agencies were also intent on killing him. And there's so many stories about the attempts to kill al Haj Malik Shabazz. There's the story about the, the week before he was assassinated, how his house was bombed, and he and his family near, uh, just barely escaped, escaped death during this situation. 
There's so many stories about how when he was traveling overseas in the last few months of his life, that he was in a hotel in Cairo, the Cairo Hilton Hotel, and how he was poisoned in the hotel by someone in the kitchen of this hotel. And his stomach had to be pumped in order for his life to be sustained. And for many of us, this would have been enough to say, okay, when I get back to the States, I think I'm gonna kinda take it easy. There have been so many attempts on my life, some that I've seen and others that I don't even know about, that perhaps I should take a back seat to the kind of public pronouncements that I'm doing. But this was not the, the heart of Al Haj Malik Al Shabazz. And in spite of all of these attempts, even coming back to the States, people trying to run him off the road in Los Angeles and uh, have him crash his car and just all kinds of things. But on February the 21st of 1965, and I'm still talking about facing death and facing it in a way that I've done everything that I could possibly do. There's nothing else that I haven't done. There's nothing I can conceive of that I could possibly do based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. When you look at actual footage, not the movie, even though if anyone has seen the Spike Lee movie about Malcolm, it depicts what I'm about to say just a little bit. But when Malcolm came on stage and stood behind this podium and the people ran up from the audience with a shotgun, with 38 caliber weapons, 45 caliber weapons, and just riddled his body with bullets, that after Malcolm had give, given salams and these men ran forward, Everyone, and I've talked to so many of Malcolm's bodyguards, because I was about 12 years old when he was assassinated, and I was living in the South, so I never had the opportunity to be in his presence. But I know many of those who were very close and intimate with him, even some who've been depicted in movies, especially in the Spike Lee movie. But what every one of them told me who was positioned in a way that they could have seen Malcolm when he was staring death in the face, when they ran up on him with a shotgun, was a look of contentment on his face. They say that he actually started to smile. And he smiled as he watched this man run up with this double barrel shotgun and shoot him in the chest. And for me, and Allahu Alam, but for me, this is a and no one is trying to get assassinated. I'm not trying to suggest this. But this is what Allah gave him in order to set an example for so many millions of other people. The kind of courage, not just talking about any one group of people, but the courage of being a da'i and living with the consequences of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Determines, outcome, determines outcomes, and we have no control over these things. Brothers and sisters, the angel of death is a phenomena that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, talks very much about this angel that is assigned to come after the soul of each and every one of us. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has made it clear that there will be a category of human beings who have lived their lives in a way that at the time of the approach of the angel of death and the angels are saying, comfort to the soul to just come out because your Lord wants to meet you. Your Lord is pleased with what you've done. So at the point of death, that person before the soul is taken from the body. They've already been given the glorious announcement that your Lord is pleased with you. Come on out the body. There's something much better waiting for you. And when you get that kind of pronouncement, when you have that assurance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you, 
So come on out. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says that the soul is taken so gently out of the body that it's like a piece of silk cloth and just a drop of water just slowly gliding down this piece of silk cloth. So that person, and I believe that El Haj Malik El Shabazz had that message that he was able to just look at this imminent death and just have a smile on his face because he realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allahu A'la, that Allah was pleased with him and the work that he had done. And then similarly, there are those that the angel of death will come after. And you know this hadith better than I. But that the angel of death will come for certain souls and they're disbelieving souls. And so that when the angel comes, he gives the announcement, basically just come out of there. Allah is mad at you. He's angry at you. You lived a life in disobedience. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu described how that soul will start running around in the body. No, I don't want to come out. Please don't take me out of here. Because that soul has been given the announcement that their Lord, who they may have denied, either denied it through pronouncement or denied it through their own behavior, that their Lord is displeased. And so they are the soul starts running around in the body. No, I'm not coming out. And the Prophet Sallallahu has said that that soul will be snatched and torn from the body. And he gave the analogy of the simile is torn like a piece of wet wool where you take some kind of thorn plant like a, a rose with the thorns on it and you just drag those thorns through this piece of wet wool, that this is the kind of pain that would be experienced by that disbelieving soul who has gotten the announcement that Allah is displeased with, with you. And Allah now wants to give you what you have earned throughout your life in this world. Uh, so brothers and sisters, just a couple of more quick um, um, uh, uh, just a couple of quick points. And uh, I want to apologize to you before I end. Uh, this morning, and I should have uh, waited, but this morning I took some medication uh, because as Brother Otto was running me all over England from one point to another and you know, riding these cramped cars and all this other stuff, stuff of law. Um, my back was starting to hurt, so I took some medication. And I must have forgotten what that medication does to me. And so I apologize if I'm not being clear uh, in what I'm trying to say, but put it on the drugs. It's prescription medication. It's not that dude from US coming in here high. I'm not high, it's just, uh, medication that I've taken for my back and I'm uh, struggling a little bit trying to get to the points that, that I would like to share with you today. But I do just want to share just a couple other things and that is in preparation for that day which is coming for all of us, our own individual day of judgment. We have to remember death often. It's not in a creepy kind of way. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has made it clear to even visit the grave sites. Not going there at midnight, not thinking that you're summoning up any kind of spirits, not going praying to a very good believer who is buried in the cemetery, but just to go there and just to be reminded of death because all of us one day will be at that same place in the, in the cemetery. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has said that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to hear the screaming and the torture that's going on in the grave, if Allah allowed us to hear it, he said that we would be so afraid we wouldn't even bury our dead. You couldn't find anyone to go into what appears to be a very peaceful and tranquil place in the cemetery 
But if we could hear what was actually going on in those graves, we would be even afraid to bury our own dead. So there's a reason that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu instructed us, go visit the graves often. As I say, not in a creepy kind of way, but to be reminded of death itself. And also, uh, we have <coughs> the responsibility to try to make every action that we do, every thought that we have during the course of a day, an act of ibadah. <coughs> because this is a deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful to us that we can get <coughs> barakah from coming to school, doing good in our classes. We can get barakah by remembering those who are less fortunate. We can get barakah by doing so many things if we remember Allah and our uh, intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to end on this point, inshallah. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, we will do it after uh, my brother Adol um, makes a presentation to you. Assalamu alaikum. <coughs>